starting at number 10, we have Fatouche. Well, what is this anyways? Well, it's a Mediterranean fried bread salad, and the salad for the most part will have lettuce, tomatoes, cucumbers, radishes, and of course, it'll have fried pieces of pita bread. But you aren't really stuck to just using those vegetables though. There's no real set rules to follow. But what you need to have a thousand percent, like what you gotta have and include is the pita bread. Because without them, then you're literally just eating salad. So if you don't want to insult the name of Fatouche, toss in some pita bread. And by the way, speaking of the name, the word Fatouche in the Arabic language comes from the word Fateh, which literally means crumbs. To heat up the bread, you can fry them in a pan with a little bit of olive oil and lightly season them with some salt and pepper, or you can bake them for 10 minutes or so if that's what you prefer. Kibe comes in at number nine. Kibe is made of bulgur cracked wheat, minced onions, as well as ground beef. You can use lamb or goat or camel meat, and it's also topped with spices. It can also be formed into patties, so you can also bake or cook them in a broth. A common way to eat them is just dipping them into something, taking a bite. Mm. Delicious. The next food we're gonna be taking a look at is cherry kebabs. Now I'm sure all of you have heard the term kebabs before, but I found out that cherry kebabs are a very popular food in the Middle East. It originated in Aleppo, Syria, and it was mainly made by the Armenians in the area who called it fishna, meaning cherry kebab. They also go by the name kebab karaz. Now typically they're formed as small lamb meatballs that are browned and simmered in pitted sour cheese cherries, also raw cane sugar is added, as well as pomegranate molasses. Now one of the tips that I found when it comes to making them is that if you can't find fresh or frozen sour cherries, you can use dried cherries which you can then rehydrate by soaking them in water overnight. At number 7, we have one of my personal favorites baklava. This one had to be on this list. Now I can eat these all day every day. This sweet dessert pastry is made of layers of phyllo which is a very thin unleavened dough used for making pastries. Now it's filled with nuts and spices and it's drenched in syrup, one of the best parts of baklava. Now the word baklava comes from the Farsi term for many leaves. Now there are many variations of baklava and the walnut filling is a very common way to make it. It's very common in the Levant. Also pistachio or almond fillings are very popular over in Iran. You can also find baklava in the Greek culture as well. Number six brings us to Om Ali. Now it's sometimes spelled Om with a U-M-M -M instead of O-M. And this term actually means Ali's mother. Om Ali is an Egyptian classic, pretty much Egyptian bread pudding for the lack of a better term. But instead of bread, it is traditionally made with big puff pastries, phyllo or roa, which is Egyptian flat bread. And it's combined with milk and nuts, coconut flakes, sugar and raisins, it is then baked in the oven until the surface is golden brown. These also have a very interesting backstory. How the story goes is like this. Om Ali was the first wife of the Sultan Is al-Din Aybak. And when the Sultan had sadly passed away, his second wife had a dispute with Om Ali, resulting in the second wife's passing. Now to celebrate this, Om Ali made this dessert and distributed it among the people. Moving on now to number five in this video, we have Kanafa. Now this is another popular Middle Eastern dessert. Yeah, we have quite a bit of desserts on this list. I know I was a little bit biased when I put this list together, but anyways, all these foods are amazing. Like many other desserts, this is very sugary and it's layered with cheese and pistachios. Now in a bowl, you would mix cheese and sugar together. Traditionally, Akawi cheese is used, but if you don't have any, then mozzarella cheese can work just fine. Also in another bowl, you would throw in some shredded phyllo dough, and if it's frozen, make sure it's completely thawed out first, and then you mix that together with some butter. Then you place the dough on a pan and top it with the cheese mixture, then you bake it until it's brown, and then you pour syrup over it once it's all baked, and then you finally sprinkle some chopped pistachios on top. Like honestly, this looks so good. Seriously guys, if this doesn't get you hungry just looking at it, then 
you shouldn't be eating food. Just stop it. Just stop right now. Don't eat anything else. <laughs> I'm just saying. Moving on to food number four, fatire. Fatire is a Middle Eastern meat pie that can alternatively be stuffed with spinach or cheese, such as feta or akali cheese. Now, it's also described as a cheese bread, and the reason for this is because there are a couple types of fatire that can be made. One way to prepare it is kind of like a pizza where you would top the spread out dough with cheese and bake it. And another way is that you fold the dough and then you stuff it. Now I did mention some cheeses that are used but fatire can be made with halloumi cheese which is a kind of a hard cheese and it's made from a mixture of goats and sheep's milk. Also labne which is Lebanese cream cheese is used in these. Three more foods to go and the food that I had to throw in at number three is hummus. Like literally I could not make a video about Middle Eastern foods without mentioning hummus. Even if you've never heard the term Middle Eastern before you've heard the term hummus this food has become popular all around the world and now the word actually in Arabic means chick Peas. But what many people don't know is the full form of hummus is hummus bi tahini and that means chickpeas in tahini. But if you're among the rare people on the planet who just don't know the term hummus in general, let me break it down for you, okay? Hummus is a dip or spread dish made from cooked mashed chickpeas blended with tahini, lemon juice and garlic. Sometimes people sprinkle some other herbs into it. But it's really good, it's very simple to make and it's so good that I literally eat it sometimes by itself. I don't know, is that weird? Guys, I can't be alone on this. Let me know down below if you eat hummus by itself too. Number two is baba ganoush. And baba ganoush is pretty much eggplant blended up with lemon juice, tahini, and sea salt. Typically, you have to char the eggplant on a grill or over a flame of a gas stove. And I always like to look into the meaning of words, guys. And surprisingly, in Arabic, Baba means father and ganoush means pampered or spoiled. And I found a pretty interesting backstory associated with this food. According to Arabic folklore that's believed to have originated in Syria, there was a daughter who mashed all of the food that she cooked for her elderly father who didn't have any teeth, so obviously he couldn't chew food properly. Now one of the vegetables that she mashed up was eggplant and then she added in some olive oil, lemon juice as well as tahini and this led to the popular baba ganoush that we have today. Also, one thing that I really got to mention is that baba ganoush is healthy, it's gluten-free, and it's completely vegan. I know a lot of these foods that I mentioned in this episode contain milk products or meat, and usually it's eaten with pita bread, crackers, or some type of chips as an appetizer. Now, that was number two, but at number one, and there's quite a bit of reasons why this next food is number one, we have shawarma. Like, where do I begin with shawarmas, right? Okay, I've been eating these for years now, and it's one of the most popular street foods in the entire world. This dish is made up of meat slices roasted on a slowly turning vertical rotisserie, and the sliced meat, whether it's chicken, lamb, or beef, or whatever, is all packed into a large piece of flatbread or pita. Now, the word shawarma means turning, of course, in reference to the rotisserie. Now, now inside of the flatbread wrap, you'll also find hummus, veggies, as well as other sauces. You can kind of customize it and just sort of like make it to your own liking. Like, I mean, literally, like people go crazy with this. Like I know here in Canada, there's this thing called shawarma poutine. Poutine is fries with cheese curds and gravy and the chicken is added to it. Whew, Lord. Honestly, if I could eat that every single day, I would. Shawarmas, like I mentioned, they are super popular around the world. I've even heard heard them referred to as the Middle Eastern version of tacos or burritos, but whatever you want to compare them to, I don't care. You can always find these anywhere on the planet pretty much. And whatever you spend on a shawarma, it'll be worth every dollar, trust me. Starting in at number 10, we have hoppers. Now, appa or appam are traditionally eaten at breakfast. The savory bowl-shaped Sri Lankan take on pancakes are delicious at any time. You'll find them everywhere from street food stalls to restaurant menus. They're made from a batter of fermented rice flour, coconut milk, coconut water, and a sprinkling of sugar that's cooked in a small high 
pie-sided wok-like pan. Now, hoppers can be sweet or savory, but one of the local favorites is egg hoppers. An egg is cracked into the bowl-shaped pancake and then garnished with lunu miris, a sam bowl of onions, chilies, lemon juice, and salt. Unlike the runny batter used for hoppers, string hoppers are made from a much thicker dough. The dough is squeezed through a string hopper maker, kind of like a pasta press, to create thin strands of noodles, which are then steamed. String hoppers are normally eaten for breakfast or dinner with different curries. As we just mentioned above, we have sambal. Now, as the classic side dish, sambals are fresh and often fiery, chunky sauce sauces usually made with a stone pestle and mortar. Pole sambal is a mix of finely grated coconut, dried red chilies, red onion, lime juice, and a dash of Maldive fish or cured tuna. Other perennial favorites include sweet and sour sini sambal made with caramelized onion and sharp and spicy lunu miris, a flavorsome fusion of onions and red hot chilies. Sambal is usually used as an accompaniment with rice, string hoppers, hoppers, and curries. All right, let's talk about their famous vegetable curry. Archetypal Sri Lankan meal consists of a mini banquet of fragrant seasonal curries, each one bursting with flavor. You'll spot the British influence in curries featuring potatoes, carrots, and pumpkin, but more exotic varieties include meaty textured young jackfruit, long okra-like drumsticks, and bitter gourd, which resemble lumpy cucumbers. Always served with rice, white, brown, or red, Sri Lankans prefer to eat it with their hands, and it's quite a lovely experience. Coming in at number seven, we have Gotu Kola Kanda. Now, part soup, part herbal porridge, this traditional nutritious green concoction is Sri Lanka's age-old natural answer to a sugar-filled energy drink. Made from wild leafy greens, including medicinal herb Gotu Kola and Hathawariya, part of the asparagus family, and rice, it's believed to have many health-giving properties, including aiding digestion, reducing cholesterol, and boosting the immune system. Sounds like a good morning drink to start your day. And we could not talk about Sri Lanka without talking about the importance of crab. Seafood plays a major role in the country's diet, and Sri Lanka's lagoon crabs are justly famous all around the world for their succulent, sweet meat. Colombo's Ministry of Crab, which makes a regular appearance on Asia's best restaurants lists, celebrates this iconic crustacean. The catch of the day comes in a range of sizes sizes from half a kilo to the whopping two kilo crabzilla in time-honored recipes including chili crab, pepper crab, and curry crab. And making it to our halfway point in our video, we're going to be talking about kotu roti. The go-to Sri Lankan street food is a delicious stir-fry made out of what I guess you could say are leftovers. With a rhythmic clatter, the kotu maker finely slices roti flatbread together with your choice of meat or vegetables, garlic, and spices on a large iron skillet. Another favorite roti is the sweet pole roti made with shaved coconut. Eaten for breakfast, it's perfect with lunomiris and dal. Kotu, on the other hand, is served with spicy curry sauce, which you can either use as a dip or pour over your entire plate. All right, next we're gonna be talking about paripu or dal curry. Dal or lentil curry is a traditional Sri Lankan side dish often eaten two or three times a day. Red lentils are cooked in coconut milk with onions, piquant green chilies, and spices such as cinnamon, cumin, fenugreek, and pandan leaves. Thinner than its Indian counterpart with amped up spices, it's extra tasty when made in a traditional clay pot. Paripu goes with everything, but is perfect as a dipping gravy for a fresh roti or paratha. Coming in at number three, we have lampreyas. Unique to Sri Lanka, lampreyas is a savory delicacy passed down by the Dutch and is often served for Sunday lunch. 
it's kind of like a hamburger, I guess. The authentic recipe is labor intensive, including frikadels, which are Dutch style meatballs, a three meat curry infused with spices such as cinnamon and cardamom, and sini sambal all mixed together with rice boiled in a spicy stock. Then it's wrapped in a banana leaf parcel and slowly baked in the oven. It is one of the more elaborate dishes that make up traditional Sri Lankan food and it is definitely worth a try. Have you ever heard of sour fish curry? Well, there are plenty of fish curries, but ambul thial or sour fish curry is considered one of the best. Cubes of firm fish, usually tuna, are cooked in a blend of spices including turmeric, black pepper, cinnamon, garlic, and curry leaves. The secret ingredient is dried goraka, a tamarind-like superfruit that gives the dish its sour flavor. Ambul thayal is a dry curry dish, meaning all the ingredients are simmered with a small amount of water and cooked until the liquid reduces. This allows the spice mixture to coat each cube of fish. Originating in southern Sri Lanka, it's available throughout the country at restaurants that serve curry and is best eaten with rice. All right, and coming in at number one today, we have something called watalapan. Watalapan is one of the country's most popular sweets and is a must-have for special occasions. This Malay-influenced dessert is similar to egg custard with the addition of coconut milk, cardamom, nutmeg, and dark kittel jaggery or palm sugar. Bubbles of air keep this rich dish from getting too heavy and a sprinkling of chopped nuts on top adds a crunch to its otherwise silky texture. Sounds like the perfect way to end a meal. All right, starting off at number 10, we have halwa puri. Halwa puri is a traditional Pakistani breakfast that features semolina pudding or halwa and a soft fried dough called puri. Halwa is typically made with a mixture of fried semolina and sugar syrup, which is then combined with nuts such as pistachios and almonds. The sweet dish is flavored with aromatics like green cardamom pods, kara essence, and cloves, and is usually enhanced with yellow or orange food coloring for a more vibrant looking dish. Puri is a soft and fluffy fried bread consisting of dough made with flour, water, salt, and oil. Up next, we have Sikh kebab. Sikh kebab is a delicious, juicy Pakistani kebab variety made with a combination of minced meat, typically lamb, onions, garlic, ginger, coriander, lemon juice, yogurt, and garam masala. The spices used in the dish can also be modified according to personal preferences. The meat mixture is placed on skewers and the kebabs are then grilled over hot coals, giving them a nice smoky flavor in the process. Although they can also be prepared in a tandoori oven. Sikh kebab is traditionally served piping hot with salads, onions, fries, mint chutney, or flatbreads on the side. And we all know the love of samosas. Due to their crunchy texture and a variety of different flavors, samosas provide a perfect introduction to the world of Pakistani cuisine. These deep fried triangular pastries are filled with a variety of ingredients, ranging from vegetables to meat, such as onions, lentils, spiced potatoes, peas, or ground meat. These savory triangles are typically served hot and accompanied with chopped onions, yogurt, or fresh homemade chutneys made with a variety of ingredients, such as mint, coriander or tamarind. Up at number seven, we have nihari. Nihari is a popular meat-based dish consisting of slowly cooked meat such as beef shanks, mutton, or chicken. The meat is cooked together with stock and numerous spices such as cumin, cloves, garam masala, and cardamom in big vessels which are sealed with dough. It takes anywhere from six to eight hours for nihari to be cooked properly and it is traditionally consumed for breakfast since the name of the dish is derived from the Arabic word nahar, meaning morning. Let's move on to our next dish, zarda. The bright yellow zarda is a sweet and fragrant Pakistani rice dish, which consists of basmati rice cooked with milk and sugar. The rice is cooked alongside natural food colorings, which give the dish its yellow color and a blend of traditional spices, most commonly cardamom, cinnamon, and saffron. Often it also includes raisins and chopped roasted nuts, such as pistachios, almonds, or walnuts. Walnuts. Zarda is considered a rich and festive dish, usually served on special occasions, but it is also making a perfect everyday dessert enjoyed warm over a cup of refreshing 
T. And at the halfway point in our video today, we have Saji. Saji is a popular Pakistani dish originating from the province of Balakistan. It consists of marinated, skewered, and roasted lamb or chicken. The meat is typically marinated in salt, although it can be combined with green papaya paste or stuffed with potatoes and rice. Traditionally, whole chickens are roasted over an open fire so that the burning wood imparts a smoky flavor to the meat. When properly prepared, the meat should be crisp on the outside, yet juicy and tender on the inside. And consumers often squeeze lemon juice over the meat just before eating. Sounds delicious. Let's move on to paratha. Golden, brown in color, flaky and layered, paratha is a type of bread that is typically consumed for breakfast. It consists of whole wheat flour that is baked in ghee or clarified butter and comes in round, triangular, square or heptagonal shapes. Parathas are often stuffed with ingredients such as boiled potatoes, cauliflower, garlic, ginger, chili, paneer or radish. They can also be accompanied by pickles, yogurt, homemade chutneys or meat and vegetable curries. And up at number three, we have chapli kebab. A specialty of Pashtun cuisine, this spicy meat patty is prepared with a combination of minced beef or mutton. The unique taste of chapli kebab comes from spices such as dried coriander and pomegranate seeds, green chilies, and mint. Its name is derived from a Pashto word chaprik, meaning flat. And even though chapli kebab is often said to have originated in Peshawar, Today, it stands as a favorite throughout Pakistan, Afghanistan, and India. Chapli kebab are traditionally served with yogurt sauce, salads, and naan bread. Up next, we have another favorite. Biryani is one of the most famous and loved Pakistani dishes. This is a rice dish generally seasoned with spices and usually served as a main dish. Ingredients such as mint leaves, raisins, and rose water give the long-grained rice authenticity. And if you like, ghee can also be used to replace oil. Mutton, herbs, and toppings such as carrots and saffron together with nuts are mixed together when it is served. Biryani is widely cooked in different varieties, served at parties, and made on holidays. Hyderabadi biryani, Sindhi biryani, and Karachi biryani are also considered to be some popular varieties. And up at number one in today's video, we have chicken karahi. Chicken karahi is a poultry dish that is very popular in Pakistan. The word karahi in its name refers to a thick and deep cooking pot similar to a wok in which the dish is prepared. Apart from chicken, the dish is also made with red chili powder, cumin, garam masala, ginger, allspice, cardamom, tomatoes, and garlic. When prepared with mutton, the dish is known as gosht karahi. It is traditionally served with rice, roti, or naan. Yeah, so starting at number 10, we have sarmali or cabbage rolls. Now, this is probably one of the best examples of traditional Romanian food. This is made of minced pork or other types of meat mixed with rice, all rolled into sour cabbage leaves. Now, you gotta then boil it for hours in a sauce made from the juice of sauerkraut, as well as tomato juice and other spices. Next up, we have salata de boof or beef salad. Now this is a festive dish that is just super simple to make. Why? Well, because it's made from the leftovers of making soup. So then you add in your vegetables and your meat that's cut into like these small little cubes. And then you gotta also add in some mayonnaise with some pickles. And originally this dish was only made with beef, but now a lot of Romanians just use chicken instead. So it kind of defeats the name, but either way, it still tastes good. At number eight, we have misi. Misi or mitite translates as the small one. Of course, that means the food is pretty small, but from time to time, you'll find some people making bigger misis around Romania. Now, they're a mix of minced pork and beef with garlic, sodium bicarbonate, as well as other spices. Now, they're best served hot off the grill with some mustard, and they're absolutely delicious. Two. Here we have siobar de berta, which is beef tripe soup. Now, I'm not a tripe kind of guy, okay? But apparently, Romanian beef tripe soup is so good that it will turn the biggest skeptics into new beef tripe soup converts. Now, this is served with some sour cream, vinegar, and a garlic paste known as mujde. The next food is varza a la kluj, which is a kluj style cabbage. Now, this is kind of like sarmali, but made a bit differently, okay? So, you have the 
your minced meat, your sauces, and sauerkraut oven baked. Now this is often served with some sour cream, and you can find this in various parts of Romania, but it's most popular in the northern region of Romania. Next up we have Ayani Kusiolan, or aka in English, beans with hawks. Now it's very simple, yet popular, and super tasty too. So you got your beans with a large chunk of smoked pork hawk, or any other type of smoked meat, and this dish is typically cooked up and eaten in the winter season, along with some pickles. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Very simple, but you know, a lot of times the most simple foods are often the most tasty. Papanasi comes in at number four. Mmm, yeah. Dessert time, okay, so my favorite part of any meal. This is usually made of cottage cheese or any other type of cheese, and these are rolled up into like these donut shapes, and sweet cream filling is added, as well as they're topped with jam, usually of course with like some sort of berry or cherry type of jam. Now anything with filling of course is a little bit difficult to make, so if you're not too savvy with your dessert making, you can grab these in restaurants to enjoy as well. The next food is Kozonak, so this sounds Sounds like something I need to have up in my mouth right now and in my belly, like for real. So this is a sweet bread filled with a sweet walnut paste, poppy seed paste, or some type of Turkish delight. And you can get these year round, but they're usually made during the holiday season. And some say homemade kozanak is the best way to go. Well, homemade or not, like literally, just give me some right now. The second last food is pomana porculio, which means honoring the pig. Now this is an old tradition, and pomana porculio is eaten in the honor of the pig that had just been slaughtered. And this happens usually before Christmas in the month of December. The meat from the pig is cut into large pieces and deep fried, and anyone who was part of the pig's slaughter gets to eat it, and this is paired with tuka, which is a traditional alcoholic drink, and you can find this dish served in restaurants too, but it's just not the same. And the final food in this episode is drob de meal, which is lamb drob. So lamb drob is ultra delicious, and it's made during the Easter holiday. Pretty much it's a meatloaf with boiled eggs inside of it. So you have minced lamb variety meats, green onions, eggs, and bread dipped in milk, and it's then baked together along with some parsley, garlic, and other herbs. You can also use chicken or turkey liver depending on your preference. And unlike most of these dishes, however, lamb drove is served cold. Hmm, very interesting, but still sounds like it tastes pretty good. Okay.